All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, this presentation, as you can see, using OpenStack in for the benchmark at Cloud. I'm Melvin Hillsman, uh, work with Rackspace. It's my good friend Isaac Gonzalez, who works with Intel. So a little bit about me. Um, previously, I worked on Rackspace's private cloud uh, team providing support to large, large customer install bases, you know, finance, um, e-commerce, mobile, big data, et cetera. And I currently have the honor of being a technical lead on the OSIC operations team. Uh, that's where me and Isaac work together. And as you can see here, you can reach out to me, Mr. Hillsman, pretty much any and everywhere, IRC or Snapchat, Instagram, whatever. Thank you, Melvin. Uh, so I'm Isaac Gonzalez. Uh, I've been working for Intel for almost five years now. Um, we're on uh, the OC with Melvin, uh, based in San Antonio. Um, um, we both are on the ops, ops engineering team. Uh, you can reach me out on IRC. That's my IRC handle, yep. pretty cool. much. All right, so basically we're going to talk about OpenStack Innovation Center, just kind of those who do not know what it is. And then uh, we'll talk about workloads. We'll talk about OpenStack Infra, as you can see the agenda here what we deployed, and then some issues and remediations. All right, so OpenStack Open Innovation Center, uh, exactly what is it? Okay, uh, so essentially, for those who are not aware, it's a joint effort between Rackspace and Intel, started in 2015. Uh, we recently celebrated our one-year anniversary, one anniversary a few months back. Uh, at the uh, heart of our efforts is uh, the passion to accelerate the enterprise adoption of OpenStack. Um, essentially, we contribute uh, as well all of our work upstream. So you can go to like github.com slash OSIC and things that we've done, you can you know, participate as well as download and use if you so decide. Um, so why should you care? Uh, at the end of the day, we foster open, uh, open source principles. We align with the goals of the OpenStack Foundation. Uh, again, we contribute all of our work upstream. So for Rackspace and Intel, right, it pretty much is a good deal, right? But what does that mean for you guys? Um, as contributors, developers, operators, consumers, producers, end users, et cetera, what, whatever you see yourself as in the community, at times, like you can find it difficult to implement a new feature, um, use a tool or a third party of a third party resource, right? Uh, in your current environment, you may have you may not have the funding, you may not have the people, you simply may not have the time. So we do. Uh, or uh, uh, OSIC is a great resource to address uh, most, if not all, these needs. Uh, we again align with the OpenStack Foundation, um, so it only helps in the long run that if you begin to work with us or use some resources that we offer, that there's kind of a, a, a great opportunity to get your code implemented, talk, uh, just put in front of the right folks, uh, so forth and so on. That can, it can only help right, your relationship with the community when you work with us. So it's not something that's outside of the community or um, something we're trying to do um, to circumvent the community. OSIC's roadmap focuses mainly on, uh, primarily on manageability, scalability, reliability, high availability and security, as you can see in the slides here. Um, you can go to OSIC.org to basically get more about us, see this and some additional information. Um, these things can be primarily seen in our um, ease of deployment, live migration, and high availability of services, testing, and validation. Uh, we're also heavily invested in training and recruitment. Um, so basically, uh, we've had issues, unfortunately, with our slides, so um, I did want to, I won't do that, but I did want to present to you basically how much time over this first year, how many developers we train, how many hours of development. I think um, there's like basically one year of work that has already gone into the amount of, like we have core, we have folks who have gone through development that have become core reviewers. Um, there's just basically a lot of work, and again, go to OSIC.org to kind of get all that. Uh, and last but certainly not least, if you again go to osic.org, there's the developer cloud, which is basically it's a thousand node, two thousand node cluster. 
that you can request resources. There's bare metal resources as well as um, essentially virtual machines within an existing OpenStack cloud. All you have to do is sign up for it. And generally, our only request is two weeks after you're done using the resources, you generate a white paper that says you know, how you succeeded or how you failed and what you were trying to do and how the resources helped you. All right. So again, I mean, we're here, right, because we're on the operations team. So operators are our general stakeholders. Um, we provide and they provide us data and feedback on solutions. Uh, we also assist heavily in the operator community by um, helping to schedule these, the Ops Summit stuff that's happening, the mid-cycle, um, contributions to the uh, operator's code bases that are up online. All right. And Isaac's going to talk about the what and the how. All right. So as, Mel as Melvin mentioned, we have uh, in the OSIG ops team, we have our roadmap, right? We have several KPIs. We want to test out features, you know, live migration, high availability of services, stuff like that, scalability, upgradability of pure OpenStack. So we do this at scale. We are using the developer cloud to actually test all those things at scale. So when we just got uh, this task, right, we figure out that in order to test all of this stuff, we kind of need uh, our cloud to be production-like, right? We don't want to deploy a 44-node cluster or 100-node cluster without being used. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't do any help for us to test all this stuff in an empty cloud, right? So we. We, we do need workloads, right? We got into this discussion. We got into a room for several hours trying to figure out how are we putting in, uh, workloads in our cloud so we can actually test this stuff at scale in a production-like environment, right? So we consider a lot of options. As, as you may know, there's a lot of tools out there that might help us do that. You have Rally for control plane, execution, perfkit, and several stuff. And uh, for data plane, you, you, you may also uh, find tools like Shaker. A uh, few, few minutes ago, uh, there was a talk on this same room about Browbit and how it can help you uh, exercise your cloud, test a lot of stuff on the scalability and stuff. So we, we came out with Infra. So Infra, so you, how, how many of you are not familiar with OpenStack Infra? All right, so we have a couple of folks. So OpenStack Infra team uh, is in charge of supporting the systems that uh, test all the gating for the OpenStack developers, right? Um, they have all the Zool uh, jobs. They have all the infrastructure for Garrett and stuff like that. So they basically run uh, workloads and tests every single day, like they create a lot of VMs per day. And we, we kind of get into it, reviewing what are the requirements for them to run their workloads in our clouds. So we think about what, why, why infra is going to help us. Well, we have this transient workload. It's not like a synthetic, static workload that we'll be running constantly. So OpenStack infra will give us this transient peaks and stuff that with synthetic tools will be very hard to achieve. So, and plus, we will be doing a community good, sharing, uh, sharing uh, our resources with OpenStack Infra to help this greater good, which is providing our developers, OpenStack developers, a better testing infrastructure, right? So this is where we decided to contact them, get in touch with them, and hey, what do you guys need to run your workloads in our clouds? So we have two clouds. Melvin's going to talk about, about that. Um, so this is what we deployed for OpenStack Infra. All right, again, right? So the, the idea is that we had some tasks we needed to complete. We needed to generate some workloads, right? We wanted to be as close as possible to what would actually be happening in production. So. In OSIC, we have two separate, we have a bunch of clouds, but we, we identified two specifically to help with this effort. 
So we have a smaller cloud called Cloud8, which is basically is a 22 node um, cloud for the OSIC engineering team. This cloud primarily is focused on development and testing, uh, and it's not expected to be available uh, very long for infra. This is relevant to infra. So reaching out to infra, that was kind of our initial ask of them. It's like, hey, if we gave you guys these 22 nodes, right, um, could we take them away if we needed to make some changes, adjustments based on data that we got back? And they were, they were perfectly fine and okay with that. So that worked for us. That goes back to the flexibility and, and the why of Infra, right? Um, and then development and testing, we have Cloud One, which is, um, Cloud One is probably 300 plus nodes, bare metal nodes, running a lot of stuff that we can't just tear down when we see fit. So the, the benefit of Cloud Eight is that the things we learn in Cloud Eight, we can trans, like, translate those into Cloud One. So again, Cloud One is longstanding. It offers more resources. Um, and again, it digests the findings of Cloud Eight uh, into Cloud One. So here is a, um, here's a graph of Cloud One. Not all of the, um, of course, like I said, it's at least 300 nodes. Not all those nodes are listed here, it can be seen. But this is basically like the architecture of Cloud One, in a sense. Um, so right now, between Cloud One and Cloud Eight, we actually, um, the OSIC team is providing um, just as many VMs to OpenStack Infra as every other provider combined. Um, I say that because the benefit, the, again, the benefit is that we're doing the community good, and you can as well as well as you can get, right, you can get feedback on your environment prior to you testing or doing something um, in production. You can do it uh, in development. So issues and, re issues and remediation, remediations. So uh, with doing this, of course, deploying OpenStack Infra is not, a, uh, is, is not really a simple task, per se. Uh, you would definitely need the help of OpenStack Infra unless you have some considerable folks to dedicate to it. Um, and, and again, that's where the benefit came into us of we had stuff we needed to do right then. Uh, and Infra was definitely available there for us. So issues we ran into were IPv6 related, uh, raw images versus QCAL images, uh, thing, uh, provider network priority. This was regarding multi-home networks and then some FDB table uh, max issues we ran into. Uh, one second, I'm sorry. So what I'm gonna show you is, I'm gonna show you a chart, the grafana.openstack.org, that basically this is, uh, this is the OSIC clouds here, the resources that we're providing to Infra. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back a little bit in time here and show you where we had issues and then we'll talk about uh, our remediations and you will be able to see the differences. All right, that's all of them. All right, so these graphs here are, are most relevant to us so as you can see, ready no launch attempts, this is basically amongst all the clouds, or oh, Cloud One and Cloud Eight in particular, but the different um, quote unquote provisions that are given to Infra within those two clouds. This is like the, you know, Infra is launching a bunch of nodes, right? So there's ones that are, uh, ones that are being built, ones that are being deleted, um, ones that are, in, that are currently in use. And then here you can see, um, Obviously, there's a lot of errors early on, right? I mean, you have almost 500, uh, at one point, almost 500 uh, nodes were failing to be launched, okay? Uh, and then again, here as well, um, time was increased, but it's, you know, again, in this early portion, you can see there's a significant amount of time to, uh, for those nodes to become ready. Uh, and then you can see, again, here's those peaks and valleys that, um, that Isaac mentioned where basically you're getting somewhat of a real production-like activity going on within these, these, uh, these clouds. 
So with these issues, this is what we were having. We were seeing, you know, hundreds of nodes failing at times, um, higher uh, amount of time to, um, for those nodes to become ready. Further down again, uh, job run times were higher. Um, going back up, some of the uh, API calls, again, for creating servers, getting servers, deleting servers, so forth and so on, they were all high, right? So how we fix, I'll, I'll talk about the IPv6 issue. So what was happening is traffic was getting dropped um, when, we, when we wanted, so again, the issue was we didn't have enough IPv4 addresses because Infra needs a static IP for uh, the VMs that they're launching. So of course, we're giving them 1,000 um, VMs and we don't have 1,000 IPv4 addresses to match. So we said, let's move it to IPv6. Um, but the requirements were not only within the clouds themselves, but there were edge devices that needed to be changed um, this, uh, in order to support the IPv6. So what we ran into was that configuration we had on the switches regarding LACP, we had to disable that um, in order to get IPv6 to work because with multi-home networks, uh, what was happening is the uh, first available, so in Liberty, the first available NIC, um, no, I'm sorry, that's provide network property. Uh, well, no, yes, I'm sorry, my apologies. So LACP needed to be disabled on the switch in order for us to, uh, in order for the traffic to not get dropped when we switched from IPv4 to IPv6. Uh, this was dealing with um, router advertisement issues uh, that you get with IPv6. Yeah, I'll let Isaac hit on the uh, raw versus QCOW. Yep, so when uh, we just started launching VMs uh, at first, so in our reference architecture, we have Ceph install, right? We need shared storage because we were doing some live migration testing. And um, at some point we realized that some VMs were taking like 30 minutes or more to build. Uh, and basically we, well, using this Grafana that uh, OpenStack Infra provides out of, right out of the box as soon as they're up and running in your cloud, we figured out that actually Ceph is trying every single time to it builds a VM is trying to convert this QCOW to image to a RAW, right? Um, the, the fix was released, which is like put the, all the images in the RAW so that there was not conversion needed anymore. Yep. So, so pretty, pretty easy fix, right? Yep. Um, but Infra was running perfectly fine before that, before we introduced the Ceph back in stores, right? They were, you know, they're using it. Um, folks are launching plenty of VMs, but with us wanting to do some live migration tests, we, we needed a shared storage backend. And of course, this introduced an issue where it wasn't one there before. So again, I'll show you in a second how we, what those times look like after this. So then provider network priority was, a, was another one where this was related to upgrades Liberty to Mataka. So in Liberty with multi-home networks, again, IPv6, IPv4, is that the first NIC that's available was set as the gateway. And of course, uh, well, in our situation, IPv4 was the one that was being set versus IPv6. Um, in, in Mataka, it was changed from the uh, first NIC to the fastest NIC. So that's where the, that's where the problem came in. So we had to force um, the router, we had to do some routing uh, uh, magic to make it where that the NIC that we wanted um, would be available the IPv6 versus the IPv4 so that the gateway uh, would get set appropriately. And then again, that was, uh, we were able to resolve some of these uh, failures that you guys were seeing. So as you can see, like, like I said, during those times, there were a lot of failures. If we look at um, this week so far, Again, there's not as many uh, launch attempts, uh, error node launch attempts. So we know, I mean, magnitudes down from, like I said, three to 500 down to three, four. Um, and even some of those sometimes as Infra was, there was a talk Infra was doing earlier, uh, where sometimes uh, if they like push a new image, you'll get a failure just because it's a new image um, sometimes. So. It's not always necessarily that, but again, from three or five, three or five hundred down to one, as you can see, is the norm to maybe three is very, very good. 
uh, ready node launch attempts. So you can see there's a lot more color there, which means uh, there was a lot more activity that could be handled. Um, and then again, here's the number of resources they use. If we zoom out just a tad bit, we'll see that there's been, uh, of course, things have died down now because um, we're all here. But if we go back, you can see that the number of launch attempts, you know, you've got 200 here, over 100 here, over 100 here, um, you know, and I mean, there's, you know, large numbers here as well. So close to, I don't know, four or 500 nodes, uh, again, uh, VMs receiving the benefit of the changes that we made and us pushing that code or those information like the LACP thing, we got to talk with Cisco about that um, and start working on resolving some issues in our switches um, across, uh, across the board versus just specifically the Cloud One. And so next steps. So yeah, more, more than next steps here, uh, I will like to see is like a call to action, right? So we started all this just thinking about workloads, right? We were just thinking about our KPIs or our roadmap goals. How are we generating or how are we getting someone to use our over cloud so we can, you know, catch stuff that other way, otherwise like with uh, synthetic workloads, it won't happen. Right, so if you're in your company, you have dev environments, you have some resources to spare, please, I mean, don't hesitate to contact OpenStack Infra, share, share your resources, and you'll get, like I said, all that Melvin showed you, it's right out of the box as soon as they're up and running. So here's what they need. Um, basically two tenants, access to Nova and Glance APIs, uh, disk with 500 gigs, and for the note, this, this first instance is for the mirror, uh, images and a bunch of stuff there. And for the node pool, where the actual test gate VMs that Zool will spawn, those are the requirements. So there's no like any fancy requirement you might need to get infra up and running, it's just that requirement and a public IP for every, every single VM. So, again, like I said, right, um, other than, you know, testing your own stuff, you get someone that can give you feedback before going out on production. You, you have metrics right out of the box. But more than anything, I think that one of the key uh, companies for OpenStack to be successful, to be adopted by uh, uh, enterprise is that we, I'll support our developers, which is like core. It's really important that for them to have a really good testing environment so they don't have to wait that much time to their test to run. So I encourage you to contact OpenStack Infra, uh, IRC. Uh, they have uh, Fungi, their PTL there. So that's pretty much it. Some credits or of the people involved in this effort. Uh, we have Paul right there, <laughs> and yeah. Questions on developer cloud, OSIG. You're happy to. If you could go to the mic, uh, yep. it's not there. This one right here. Okay. Yeah, it's a yep. mic right here. Great presentation, thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Um, so, in terms of your reference architecture, is that documented anywhere? And is that something that we can take advantage of? Um, just based on what, what, what the goal is here, I'm very excited and I'd, I'd like to do that inside of our company as well, so. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, are you saying in regards to what we did for Infra? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we don't have that documented, I would say, no. However, you are welcome to reach out to us. And this guy in the back side middle, is that Paul? Paul, <laughs> raise your hand. Yeah, don't look back. <laughs> no, so Paul, Paul is a great resource. Uh, he helped us get, um, get ours up and running. Um, 
I mean, if you have resources, please reach out to them, and they can definitely get you get you up and running really quick. And they're they're if you run into issues, they're very good at sticking with you and helping you resolve those issues as well. Looking into the logs that they have available to them that you may not be able to see. Um, so very very good team to work with. Yeah, and like like we mentioned, if you go to the ozic.org website, you 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 can you will find uh, blogs and and stuff that we're doing there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we will be publishing white papers and all the reference architectures we have and stuff like that. Yeah, I would say that there's probably not a specific architecture that you may have to implement, like have to implement, but there are certain requirements, as we showed that they would they would exactly yeah they would need. Um, any other questions? Do you have, do you have uh, the? Onboarding and the requests and provisioning is that automated, or are you having to kind of manage that in the background after somebody requests the access? So if I were to come in and I'd say I'd like to get you know three racks and this many vCPUs, do you guys have that automated, or is it something that just somebody goes out there and assigns? Yeah. Things? So if you go to osic.org, as Isaac is showing, you click on access the developer cloud. Uh, it's, it's simply a form that you fill out. Um, I think the process is going to move away from this into GitHub. I don't, don't, don't quote me on that, but I believe so. It's, we're actually trying to make it easier and make it, again, publicly visible because our efforts are to you know, uh, um, align with the OpenStax Foundation openness. Um, but yeah, so you basically, you sign up, and we give you servers that have been tested that we know can run an operating system. We know there's no issues. Well, at the time we give them to you, there's no issues with NICs. You know, hard drive, so forth and so on. Uh, we, all, we did, however, perform uh, an effort called novice install, where basically we took, um, so there's this myth that OpenStack is crazy difficult to install, right? And we wanted to debunk that. So we took basically over eight iterations uh, of who we identified as novices, some folks that had some experience already in kind of uh, OpenStack and a little bit knew about it, and then some folks who were kind of totally green. And over eight iterations, we went from bare metal provisioning all the way to logging into Horizon from 40 hours to just over six hours. So again, um, OpenStack, uh, github.com slash OSIC, you should be able to find the stuff there. If it's not there, you can reach out to uh, hash or pound OSIC dash ops in free nodes where we all hang out at, and we can definitely get you the information that you need because it's not proprietary. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Sure. So when I think of uh, benchmarking to improve product, I usually think of gating on a benchmark, right? And make sure that you block the developer who slows your cloud down. Um, in this case, you've moved your, your, your benchmarking um, out of phase with your CI. So what are your feedback processes like to make sure that when your infra on Cloud8 discovers a problem, that that gets rolled back into your product? So, I mean, again, we, the good thing is that you are, you are pretty much in control. So that's kind of what you alluded to, right? I have the control to restrict something from happening. Um, so you do have that control with, with Infra. Again, we said, hey, we need to be able to stop you guys from using our cloud. And if we need to make some adjustments, make those adjustments and then re-enable it. The good thing about Infra at the end of the day is just code. So these guys are very helpful, like I said. And you simply, you could do it yourself. You send a patch that says, um, you know, max servers or minimum servers for this provider, which is me, zero. Once that's implemented and you can talk with them, they can get it done in short order, then now there's no more infra jobs coming in or until the ones that are currently there, you know, finish. And then you can do whatever you need to do, get whatever feedback again, they'll provide data, you'll have data, um, make your changes, make your adjustments or whatnot, and then send another patch hey, re-enable X number of servers or max servers, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Wait for them or talk with them, short order, you're back up and running and you can get more data um, relevant to your cloud and your, your, your adjustment. Yeah. So is, does that answer your question or kind of? Okay. Um, I guess I'm less curious about how you work with 
infra and more curious about how you work with your internal developers and integrators to make sure that, you know, okay, there is a problem with our cloud. Uh, you know, how does that get noticed? How does that, how, do, how does the fix get into your product so that it sure. doesn't have okay. to be a mess? Yeah, we monitor it. So first, first of all, we yeah, don't we see our reference it. architectures as product, right? So what we, so core thing of the OSIC, everything we do goes back upstream. So well, every, every single time we find something in our reference architecture, the output should be reported back to the community, right? So that's what we do. We find maybe we found bugs. We have bug bugs for OpenStack, Ansible. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying different deployment tools. So the whole goal here is to get this feedback out to the community, out to the developers, through white papers, through bugs, and stuff like that. But, but you can, again, that, so you would have your own internal monitoring mm -hmm. team, right? You would have your own processes and procedures to do that. So for example, for us, um, we use, and we decide on Influx data stack, the tick stack, to monitor. Um, and so we were able to see certain things again happening. We already had some monitoring tools from, because it's an effort between Rackspace and Intel, and we were able to lean on the Rackspace uh, expertise, then now, you know, the things that these guys were seeing, the line of communication, the openness that we had, then we could say, hey, we're having issues trying to get IPv6 running. Let me grab a network engineer, you know, off of whatever he was doing and spend some time with them. Let's figure out, let's start tracing some packets, so forth and so on. So that's kind of the process. I would say it's the same process you would use uh, for any other uh, issue you find and uh, way you resolve it uh, in, within your own particular company. Does that better answer it? Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. All, right. Oh. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. Or if you want to use the cloud, go use it. Sign up, osic.org. <laughs> Stop playing. <laughs>